Join us every Friday for encouragement, freedom, and biblical truth. Grab your coffee or grab your tea. It's going to be a good one. Hello, everyone. Was I proper on that? Hello, everyone. Okay, just kidding. So, hey, everyone, Kim here. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. It's going to be a good one. And I know I say that every single week, but this is going to be a good one. Uh, a little bit ago, um, a little while ago, uh, I had someone on the my one of my subscribers reach out and come to find out she has an amazing life clip. She lives uh, very close to me. So we joined each other. We had lunch, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here when she comes on the show. And we bonded, we connected, and her life clip was absolutely amazing. So that is why she's here today. However, um, she does come from what you, I guess, would deem a famous background. And her dad is this gentleman right here. So yes, her father is four-star general Norman Schwarzkopf. And he did pass away in 2012. So I just want to preface that, that he's not living today. However, for any of us, I guess, old timers, we would definitely know him. We would know him from sit downs with someone famous like this, Colin Powell. That photo there was taken in 1990 in Saudi Arabia. And this was the whole Kuwait war, everything that was going on. I shouldn't say the war happened then, but so this was that photo there. They were coordinating events. This photo here is, uh, I think, quite popular. I think a lot of people have seen this. This was him in Operation Desert Storm, Saudi Arabia, uh, January 12th, 1991. And I really remember this because I graduated high school. Yes, I'm dating myself in 1992. And I remember I was in Florida living in Ocala, of course. And I remember the headline that came up when I was a junior in high school, the whole front end of the newspaper was plastered about we're going to war. Or this means war. So I remember that. I remember the headlines. And then what about this one here? This one here is where he is talking to uh, four Marines. And this was actually right before they headed into the ground war in 1991. What an amazing photo. This is here. He is uh, greeting an Iraqi Lieutenant General Sultan Hashim. Ahmad. So this was an amazing capture. This was done in 1991. I found this photo very, very nice. Um, and I'm actually stealing these photos from NBCnews.com. It's a slideshow that they had put out um, when he had passed away in 2012 in honor of him. So this is actually where I'm getting this from. That link will definitely be in the show notes because I don't want to plagiarize someone else's photos and captions. This following photo. So if you don't know what era, what president he was under, here we are with President George Bush. And this was taken in 1991 as well. This one here, I enjoy it as well. It is him getting a standing ovation. This is when our both parties would come together, um, both Democrat and Republican. Too bad we don't have that today. But this was him getting a standing ovation May 8th, 1991, and they were supporting him during the Persian Gulf War. This one here was his thumbs up in a parade that they gave for their welcome home in June 10th, 1991. So you can see they went to war quite early and it seemed like they finished quite quickly. So I don't know all the ins and outs, never been in the military, but it certainly does not happen like that today. I know wars draw, drag out. 
um, because it's a money machine. This one right here is a really great photo. Um, not so much with the Dick Cheney, but definitely Colin Powell and four-star general Norman Schwarzkopf. And I really enjoy this one. I do like this one as well. It is uh, George H.W. and Barbara Bush putting the Medal of Freedom around his neck in a White House ceremony. This one here, I love it. I love his smile. I, you know, um, he just looks like this cool Mac daddy, four star general. And uh, anyway, so this was a great photo. I really enjoyed it. And it says here again, I will share this link with NBC News. Um, he died Thursday, December 27th, 2012 in Tampa, Florida. He was 78 years old. So with that being said, I am honored and I am privileged to not only have Jessica on this show, but to also call her friend. I'd like to bring on my next guest, Jessica Schwartzkopf. So, hey, everyone, Kim here. As you can see, I do have, uh, as I said before, not only a podcast listener, but my friend Jessica here. So, hey, Jessica, how are you doing? Hey, Kim, how are you? I am good. So Happy I know that you here. were Thank running you. around ragged before the meeting yeah. started. Um, and uh, so I appreciate you being here and taking time right. out. Um, right. So normally what I do is I will introduce my mug before the guest comes on. But okay. both of us, I think, have special mugs here today. Everyone thinks I hate America, and I don't. I just don't like the American gospel. I like the biblical gospel. Big difference. Amen. So I'm going to introduce my mug first, and then you'll introduce yours. And also, guys, this is Jessica, the one when I introduced her mug that she gave me um, that uh, y'all need Jesus. So that <laughs> this is the Jessica. So anyway, um, this is my mug here today, and it's simply America the Beautiful. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. And I've got a nice little tea in here for me because I'm sure you're enjoying this beautiful Florida weather just as much as I am. So it is beautiful right now. It is. I know. So what mug I just thought I did. I just see either a ghost behind you or is that's your baby, right? That is my dog revelation. Okay. Call him, I call him Revy for short. All right. <laughs> but that's... when he's in trouble, he's called by revelation. Revelation. Oh, kind of... Cop, get over here. Kind of like my full name of Kimberly. That's why I don't yeah, use it. Exactly. Yes. Just so like what... my mom used to do with me, Jessica Alice. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're not bringing in my middle name on this recording. <laughs> that is for sure. So what mug do you have? I actually have a really special mug. It has my father's picture on it. If you can mm -hmm. see that there. Yeah. Uh, that's my daddy saluting. Mm -hmm. And then... He had a couple rules that he lived by. Rule number one was when in command, take charge. So he just felt like when you're placed in a position of command, you got to just take charge. You got to mm -hmm. you got to go with it. And then rule number 14 is what he really lived by, which was do what's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of his his motto and that's him with some of his troops there from desert storm love it and yeah this is just a really special mug that i love to use and i look at it all the time and it just reminds me to do what's right yeah exactly so, which is sometimes difficult i know for sure it is well my that's the other thing my dad would say is we all know the right thing to do mm -hmm. the hard part is doing it yeah. Amen. It is. That's the hard part. I agree. Okay. So let's just give our listeners before we dive into how we connected, I would like people to know who you are. I do have some links. I've got your Facebook page. I've got your Instagram page. You are a producer of, and I believe it's called, yep. Hero films. Um, so I've got your social links. So that's how people can find you, but let people know without of course, going into the life clip who you are, and uh, what you do now and just let people kind of get to know you. Okay. Well, um, I live here in Florida, as you know, I actually spend my time partway between Florida. I'm here in the winter and springtime. And then I go back to call and I go to Colorado for the summer and fall. So lucky me, I kind of get to do that snowbird thing. Uh, yes. I'm semi-retired, I say, because, uh, you know, I, I get, I have the freedom to do that because of what I'm doing right now. And that is actually 
working through, uh, it's actually my LLC is Hero Films LLC. And that was set up to produce uh, a film based on my father's autobiography. It doesn't take a hero. He wrote his autobiography back in 92, 93, just after the, the Gulf War. And, um, you know, it's just, it's an amazing story. People wanted my father. He wasn't going to write a book, but he decided he would write a book because so many people wanted to know his story, wanted to know mm -hmm. the behind the scenes of the Gulf War, that kind of thing. So he decided to do it. And I'm so glad he did because it left a, a, there was so much that I learned about him through reading the book that I didn't know. And I knew my pro father pretty well, but there was so much of his history and how he really got to the place where he you know, what I call it his destiny. And he got there by doing the right thing and mm -hmm. uh, being a leader. And um, so I just think it's a story that needs to be told, especially in this day and age. Yeah. Um, and uh, but now it's moving, transitioning from a film to a series, because we can really do wonderful things with um, series these days. And I just mm -hmm. felt like more of the story could be told if um if we do the series well, um jessica we um we reached out i forgot i th did i i might did you reach out to me did i reach out to you i don't even I remember reached out to we, you okay I reached out to you you did and then yeah. we met um i was actually gonna leave because i can't stand south tampa <laughs> and uh, my patience level is about the size of a it's probably even smaller than a gnat. Clearly <laughs> you figure that out by now. Um, so I was going to leave and I'm glad I didn't leave because it was an amazing time of fellowship and getting to know you. Uh, and that is why you're here today. So I know I, again, in the beginning, I introduced your dad. Of course, you know him better than we all do. Um, very iconic figure um, for our generation that war, I think, really quick. And I did say that in the beginning, most wars, like they linger forever and ever and ever, because it is a money thing. And you could just see how far we've come in our progression of this America that I'm not liking these days. Um, mm -hmm. That it's not really about get in, get out. It's about get in, stay, 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 make money, make money, make money, and then leave. So with that being said, um, you really touched my heart hearing the beginning to the end. And I want us, I want you to talk about the beginning to the end. And I know you said that you would be open about that. And there's certain things, if you feel you do not want to discuss, I'm not going to push that. Mm -hmm. um, but your road wasn't always as it is sitting here currently today of sound mind, of sound spirit, of peace. And so if you can, because that's the whole premise of Life Clips is talk to people. Um, I always like people who are real in the faith because we still struggle until we die or fly, but bring us back. So bring us back to Jessica and we'll just have dialogue from that conversation. And so I'm going to give the floor to you now. And um, hopefully there's someone out there listening today who your life clip, it can touch them and they can go on the road today with a, either a renewed relationship in Christ because they were backslidden and in rebellion or they can, you know, fall upon their face and follow Christ today. So anyway, sister, this is your show. So go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, start from the beginning then, like the beginning, sure. the beginning. Wherever well, you feel it will take us, I am totally okay. Okay. Well, I only have one story, even though it comes out different sometimes, mm -hmm. but I've already prayed about it. So whatever's going to come out, whatever the Lord wants me to speak on, that's what's going to come out. So I always trust in that, but um, so I was, I was born an army brat, uh, in Virginia, um, and, uh, which means, you know, growing up, I moved about every year to two years of my life. So, um, I lived in many different places, uh, Hawaii, Germany, Alaska, Virginia, Washington state, Washington, DC. I mean, I was all over the place. Um, which was a great way to grow up. Actually, I really, you know, it was tough leaving my friends, but most of them were army brats too. And so, you know, either you were leaving or they were leaving, somebody yeah. was going to be leaving. So that's just how it was. That's all I really knew. Um, 
but it was great looking back now. I loved experiencing all these different, the different cultures, even in America. I mean, living in Georgia, which is where I picked up the y'all, by the way, <laughs> I say y'all all the time. Y'all need Jesus. So I picked that up from my time in, in Georgia living yeah. there. And um, so moved around a lot. Um you know, my, my father, Christian, my mother, Christian, my dad came from Episcopalian, uh, denomination and my mom was Lutheran. Um, so, but on an army post, you know, the church there is really non-denominational because there are so many different denominations, um, which was great. And I think was really a blessing for me because it was basically, you know, Bible teaching. It wasn't really getting into any particular, you know, nuances of, of all the different denominations. It was really just, you know, good old fashioned, sing some hymns, mm -hmm. hear the Bible, you know, do, do the, you know, take communion. And then you were, you were on your way. So mm -hmm. it was, um, so I remember having a very deep faith from a young age. Um, you know, my parents were the kind that, didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk. Yeah. And, um, you know, even though you know, everybody thinks, oh, your dad was a general, so he must have been so strict. You that's know? what I asked you at lunch. That's I know, so right, funny. Exactly. Yeah, because that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> like, he is running the show. Yeah. Remember my was. rules or else. Yeah. I mean, he was <laughs> he was the rule maker and the yeah. disciplinarian in the house. Um but, uh, yeah, I mean, but he and my mom were a team, obviously. And, um, you know, just great examples of, you know, the big thing for him, it wasn't how clean my room was or, you know, how pressed my, you know, <laughs> uniform for school was, anything like that. His thing was, don't lie. You know, we're not going to lie. Mm -hmm. You're going to be respectful, not just to your mother and father, but, you know, with my father being the general, a lot of the people around us, most for most of the time, um, you know, worked under my father. So there would be people in the military, especially a lot of the kids or wives that would kind of take on that role of mm -hmm. thinking that they were better than other people because of the rank. Um, and my father would just say, uh, uh, I mean, you're not, you didn't earn this first of all, mm -hmm. you know, you're not the general, <laughs> I am, you know, don't go around acting like you're better than, than anybody else, um, right. just because of what I do. And, um, that was instilled in us at a very young age, my sister, my brother, and I, I'm the middle child. Um, so, you know, those were the things that he was, that's when you would really get in trouble if you did, yeah. you know, <laughs> disrespected my mother or mm -hmm. lied and, you know, just, just didn't do the right thing, um, right. which they did teach us to do the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. I just chose not to do it most right. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there got to be a point in time where uh, you know, I always feel, you know, we talk about the sin nature mm -hmm. and, you know, I know that I had that right, right out of the gate. I, you know, it wasn't anything that I was taught. I knew how to be bad from, you know, preschool. As soon as I can remember right. being able to walk, you know, <laughs> I was getting into to trouble, mostly, you know, with the neighborhood <laughs> boys. I was a big, you know, crush. I would have big crushes on boys. And, um, I don't know, just really having these, you know, I wasn't mean because I was the kind of girl that would beat up the bullies. You know, I didn't like bullies. I didn't like mm -hmm. things like that, but I guess just wanting to get into trouble and test the waters and be scandalous. I mean, even in preschool yeah. and kindergarten, you know, <laughs> so. So you were in timeout a lot. <laughs> I was, I was, there were a lot of write-ups, you know, Jessica cannot focus in class. I was much more interested in recess than really anything else school-wise. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and then my dad would, you know, we would get spanked. Um, but a, a lot of the time, 
you know, but first it was a talking to, it was, you know, he didn't just spank us to spank. Most mm-hmm. of the time my mom would debrief him when he got home on what Jessica was up to. And, um, and then he would say, okay, you know, go up. I would be waiting in, in the room upstairs and the waiting was the hardest part. Cause you mm-hmm. didn't know what was coming. The worst part was the disappointment and the anger. Cause my dad mm-hmm. had quite the temper, but the anger and like, you know, why did you do this? And why did you choose to lie? Or why did you choose to act the way that you did? And really kind of talk out where that came from. And then sometimes I would get spanked and sometimes I wouldn't, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so he he was definitely the, the disciplinarian. Um, but, you know, again, it was real important for him to teach us those life lessons. And again, you know, even though I knew those lessons and I, I knew that was the right way to go. I think from my, you know, going to church and really believing in Jesus and God, I, I really didn't have any doubts about the Christian faith. I Mm -hmm. always called myself Christian from a young age. And I can remember having a very close relationship with God and praying. Mm -hmm. I would take prayer time out and this kind of thing. And in seventh and eighth grade, I can remember that specifically, but you know, right around that time is when you're, you're getting ready to go off to college. And Mm -hmm. and I really started drinking and experimenting with that stuff around 15. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I I always had that in me because my dad, and I think it's, it's a genetic thing. First of all, we do have the sin nature, but I think different things are passed down through families. And my dad would tell me and my siblings at a very young age, okay, um, we have alcoholism in our family. So I want you to be really careful with this stuff. It might be Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving where there might be a little bit of champagne or wine. Mm -hmm. And my dad would try and use that as an opportunity to, to warn us kids. Yeah. He might sometimes let us have a little sip because he didn't want it to be a taboo thing. Right. He didn't want it to be those, one of those things where this is off limits, stay away from that because you know how, Oh, I'm supposed to stay away from it. Well, now I'm going to run right towards it. Exactly. Um, But I can, so I can remember him trying to educate us on on that as kids, but I can also remember having the thoughts like, Ooh, well, I can't wait to get my hands on that. You know, I just, the warnings just went right through one ear and out the other. It didn't Mm -hmm. matter to me where, you know, most people would be like, Oh, you know, I think that's what wisdom is, is, Mm -hmm. is that taking other people's advice and not having to make the same mistake. Exactly. Yeah. I was never good yeah. at that. I yeah. always felt like I needed to learn those lessons on my own, I guess, yeah. the hard way, which is yeah. exactly what I did. Yeah. Um, so as soon as I could, was old enough to to get out of the house and go to the movies and do this, I was sneaking around having a few beers here, wine coolers there. And, um, you know, immediately out of the gate, I knew that... Um, I don't know if I, I knew I had a problem because I didn't drink, I guess what, how normal drinkers would drink. You know, Mm -hmm. I drank to excess Yeah, really from an early age before I was legal to drink. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was already drinking and I had a fake ID. I mean, all that, that was about 16, 17. I had a fake ID so I could go out. This was in Washington, DC. So I would, mm-hmm. you know, sneak out. And normally I'd go stay the night at a friend's house because under my parents' roof, I mean, man, I had to put, I had to keep it together. You Correct. know, my father would have, I would have been in big trouble had he found out I was mm-hmm. drinking yeah. that kind of thing. Well, actually, one time my mom found a couple beers in a wine cooler under my bean bag. And, um, I mean, she was just devastated and crying and I was just begging her, don't tell dad, please don't tell dad. And she didn't, she didn't tell my dad because I figured, you know, he has enough things on his plate (laughs) to worry about. And I convinced her that it wasn't mine. I was holding it for a friend. I mean, there you go. The lying already (laughs) starting, right? Because I'm trying to get out of trouble and also downplay, you know, I I wanted to be this perfect daughter, Mm -hmm. you know, but 
at the same time, you know, I wasn't this, this desire that I had in me to drink and to go out and do these things, you know, everything that kind of comes along with that was just too powerful in me. And, Mm -hmm. um, and there was nothing in me that wanted to not go out and kind of try everything out. And, And that's exactly what I did. Things really took off as soon as I moved out from my parents' house. Cause I had to keep it together, Mm -hmm. you know, under my parents' roof. And I did a pretty good job of that. Um, But it was as soon as I got out from under my parents, you know, as soon as I moved into college, I mean, that first weekend was just, you know, set the tone really for the rest of my Mm -hmm. college years. And, Mm -hmm. um, and many years after that, really. And, and I had just kind of put God at that point, you know, around 16, when the drinking and all that stuff kind of started creeping in, that's when for me, God didn't creep out. I was just kind of like pushing him out to the side because again, I knew I'm not doing the right thing. I'm not doing what's right. Um, I was taught right and wrong. I've got that God conscience in me now that tells me, you know, this, this, this isn't the way that I want you to go. You know, I could sense that, you know, the spirit telling me like you're, you're, you're going down the wrong road. And, um, I was just like, yeah, but I, I gotta, I gotta go. This is just the way that I'm going to go. So of course I started then doubting, Oh, was Christianity really real? And, you know, this is what Mm -hmm. everybody's doing. So why, you know, um, why be a prude or not experience this kind of stuff? It just didn't see, you know, it made me feel like God was this kind of big joy kill, you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Which really, I realize now he set up these parameters around our lives to really for our own protection mm-hmm. because he loves us, sure, not because sure. he's trying to keep any kind of pleasure or good time (laughs) from us. He actually wants us to experience real joy and real pleasure. And that really only comes from him and, you know, following really the guidelines that he set down for us. Um, Mm -hmm. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know that at the time. Um, I just, again, I was, I was pretty much addicted to alcohol at that time uh, and other substances too came along and, um, and I was just in it. And that was the lifestyle that I led for a long time, even though I was still able to, you know, graduate from college, get a good job, be promoted in that job. I was still, you know, moving forward. I was able to keep the facade going that everything was okay. Mm -hmm. I had to do that for preservation and Mm. also mostly for preservation of my drinking (laughs) because Mm -hmm. I didn't want that anything to interrupt that. So I had to make it look like everything was fine so that, you know, nothing got in the way of, of my drinking. Mm -hmm. Um, but eventually, you know, God got in the way of that. <laughs> <laughs> so you stayed. So throughout the duration, you had a four year college. Four and a half. And, right. So four and a half. So through that entire college lifestyle, you lived that lifestyle. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. And did you have a circle of people around you that also fed into that flesh fuel fire, as I call it? Like, so yeah. you gravitated to people who were just like you. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, a lot, it's funny. A lot of people say, you know, don't hang out with the kids that are going to influence you. Well, I was that kid, you know, Mm -hmm. so I can't blame it on, Oh, I was hanging around the wrong people. No, I was, I was actively seeking out people Mm -hmm. like that to, to join in doing these things with. So again, it wouldn't make me feel like I was so different. Mm -hmm that so wrong for me to be doing this, um, you know, that drank and partied like I did so that it seemed, you know, semi-normal and Mm -hmm. it it wasn't normal. I knew that, but like, you know, again, you, you surround yourself so that it, it, um, you know, with the people that, you know, you can not feel so terrible about yourself (laughs) because you can 
be like, well, they're worse than me. So I'm not that bad. Exactly. So when you said substance, did you want to expound upon that um, or not? I mean, it's not really, I guess it's kind of relevant, but not really. So was it like hardcore drugs or was it just like a, a joint every now and then or? Oh, no, I became like a habitual pot smoker. Mm -hmm. um, that I would say almost became my main thing. Um, I also I had developed an eating disorder, too. That was another thing that I had mm -hmm. really from about 14, 15. I was I was always a chunky kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got teased a lot growing up and, mm -hmm. you know, was always needing to be on diets. And you know, my sister yeah. was nice and skinny. My brother was nice and skinny, you know, but I had that just I was this chunky little girl, you know, oh, and yeah. And, um, so there was always that insecurity too mm -hmm. that I had where I never felt like, even though I did have a lot of friends, I just never felt like I was really fit in with the yeah, cool yeah. kids, you know? So part of my whole thing was also being alternative, you know, yeah. I got into the whole punk rock scene or new wave, or I'd hang out with the kids that were like on the, you know, it's not the cheerleaders and the athletes, but you know, the, the more outcasts, I guess you Correct, would say. Yeah. The darker children, yeah. not in that way. I don't mean, I'm, I'm sure people are going to think I just said a racist comment. I meant <laughs> darker in their life, like probably music and just everything that we're seeing today. Like some, you know, what do they call those? The anime people or the right. um, whatever they're called. You know what I mean? But that's what I meant by dark, you know, like you're just kind of like, nirvana type people i guess is what i'm trying to say you right, know. where they didn't fit in either they weren't yeah. your cheerleader or athlete or normal you know they mm -hmm. didn't fit in so you kind of try and find that thing that click that group or that that thing that makes you fit into that group and a lot of times mm -hmm. that was either the music or you know, the, the alcohol, the drinking, the partying, stuff like that. Not that cheerleaders and athletes didn't do a lot of that either, but I just felt more comfortable with the more alternative crowd. Mm -hmm. And I was also trying to figure myself out too, you know, who mm -hmm. I was. Um, I never really, I think moving a lot, I was a chameleon. Yeah. So I was always changing. Mm. I was one person in Germany and then a different person in Georgia and then Washington state. I just kept trying to reinvent myself or, but you had to, because you were yeah. going into these different, I mean, they were extremely culturally different. Like mm -hmm. even within the United States, Georgia was very different from Washington state, which is sure. very different. Washington DC. So you had to, um, and this was when I was going to school now that, um, wasn't on post, you know, once you got a little older high school, junior high, that sort of thing. Now you were going into environments where people had grown up together all their lives. You know, you were kind of the new kid where on post, everybody was the new kid. There were lots of new kids, you know, mm -hmm. but you were the new kid. And so you had to figure out a way to really, um, fit in. So you know, so I already had my insecurity of being overweight mm. and that kind of thing. And, you know, the drinking, that was one thing that was very powerful because when I drank, it, it kind of made a lot of that go away. Right. Made me feel more comfortable in my skin, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. comfortable in different environments. Yeah. You know, Even if it was false, you know, I felt prettier. I felt more accepted, whatever it is. It's just that, you know, having that drink or two just kind of, ah, made me feel just a little bit more relaxed. The problem is, is I couldn't stop <laughs> just two, one or two drinks, you know, I, I kept it going. So you had to get real relaxed. <laughs> yeah, I had to get real relaxed. And it's not that I wanted to, I just, once I started drinking mm -hmm. and that's a part of what alcoholism is, is it's like, once you pick up the drink, you, you know, all bets are off. You don't really know, is it going to be a one or two drink night or is it going to be, I'm blacking out and I don't know where I am when I wake up kind of, mm -hmm. night. you know, yeah. you just, you're kind of rolling the dice each time. So, so during this time, uh, college and a little bit after, did your family begin to notice a change in you? Cause I'm assuming, cause then you went from 
not only the drinking, but then you had this eating disorder. So drastically you were starting to change not only in the physical form, but I'm sure the mental and everything else because of the addiction to alcohol. So were, were, were your family trying to intervene at this point? Were they just thinking it was a phase? Like, so what was going on behind the scenes on their end? Well, I mean, our lives changed drastically. Actually, the last thing my dad did before going over to um, the Middle East, going over to Saudi Arabia for Desert Shield, the mm-hmm. beginning of the Gulf. Correct. Yeah, I that forgot that one. Yeah, mm-hmm. month for itself only lasted for about a hundred hours. But Desert Shield, the setup to that 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 went on for quite a few months. So my father moved me into my dorm room at college, the all girl dorm room (laughs) and uh, (laughs) dormitory. And, um, and then he was gone. So he's out running a war. Yeah. I'm out, you know, living the way that I'm living. So for me, I mean, I had to be careful that things didn't get back because overnight my father was world renowned. He became a worldwide figure overnight. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of as a family, just like, whoa, I mean, our worlds, not only is my father at, you know, commanding this, this whole operation over there mm-hmm. in the middle, he's also become this world renowned, you know, hero for people basically. And then here I am over here, you know, experimenting, doing all my stuff in college, <laughs> trying to live, you know, my crazy life. And at the same time, stay out of being, you know, the headlines, you know, in the news, oh, look what General Schwarzkopf's daughter was up to last night, you know, while he's off trying to save somebody's country. Um, So I just got really good. I don't know if I was really good at hiding it or just the Lord, my guardian angels were up there working double time, (laughs) trying to keep me and our good family name, you know, out of trouble. I mean, honestly, I just, it, I had to, I had to kind of keep it together, which I think was a good thing for me because I never, you know, I was, there was never heroin or, you know, I was never addicted to any of the hard, hard things like Mm -hmm. that, you know, and it wasn't anything except the pot really, that was a daily thing. Um, but I would call myself more of like a weekend warrior, you know, um, it, it kind of, kept me having to keep things like held back to a certain degree um, and just not let it all go because I knew that I had a responsibility of trying to uphold this image of Mm -hmm. which was rightly deserved for my father and my mother and our family and you know that his legacy and I didn't want to be the one that brought that all you know, to yeah. tarp that in any way. So I was, I just tried to be as careful as I could, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't didn't really feel like looking back now, I wasn't really that careful, but yeah, I was protected in some way. I really agree. Yeah. I mean, not only was your dad in an army, but you know, we talked about that. God had an army oh, you yeah. know, in the spiritual realm, definitely. Mm-hmm. around you. So let's fast forward a little bit. So you, you got out of college, your life is kind of beginning. You're still on this downward spiral, this trajectory of, you know, alcoholic is my God, literally, that is my domain. That is my peace. That is my everything. So, and I know from our conversation, um, bad got worse, worse got what the heck. So take us during that little worse phase. And then, you know, then we'll lead into, of course, a little later, but now we're in that worse phase. So where, where are you now in the life where it seems like alcohol is literally, you know, choking you, so to speak. Um, okay. And just so you know, I think part of the reason, um, and I fixed the camera, so I don't, I'll keep this in so people okay. understand. So when we first started recording guys, I had my view set on speaker. So I'm assuming even in editing, you're going to see a tiny screen of me and a big screen of Jess, but um, then it dawned on me. I'm like, wait a second. So then I just changed the view. So her camera does look a lot better. We were trying to adjust that um, off editing, of course, off podcast, uh, because she's so beautiful. And I wanted to make sure that everyone saw 
the stunningness of Jessica. I remember when I I'm so digressing the story right now, girl. But when I first saw her, I was like, holy crap, she is. This is someone who's so pretty, oh. but everything about you, you were very classy. Um, and then there's me. So I really, honestly, you are stunning. So that's why I wanted to make sure can, I, I, I can, I can stroke your ego right now. I know people might not like that. I say that, but I wanted to make sure that your beauty showed up on camera. So now, since I have it in the right view, and I'm sure everyone watching is going to be like, that's a lot better. So I apologize about the small screen, but you know, guys don't need to see me anyway. But now we have, you look much better, just so you know. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Okay. So now I digressed on something and that's what I do here on Life Clips. Uh, that's what women do in general. Okay. So now we're in the worst phase. Um, okay. And so let's take us through that journey. How did you get to where you are in this part of your life? Not okay. physically right now, but that part. Right. Well, like I said, God intervened basically. And he had been intervening the whole time because, you know, while living this whole lifestyle, I, there, ugh, I had this conscience, you know, not only because of, you know, my fan, I was that I was worried a lot about my family and having something come out in the news and all that sort of thing. But I had that God conscience, like, this is not, you know, this is not the way you're supposed to be living. This is not how I want you to be living. This is, you're not, you know, living under what you know is God's will for you. So I always had this conscience. And it's funny because my friends, my other friends who were in that lifestyle with me were always like, why are you so, why does this bother you so much? You know, you need to just get over it. You know, it's yeah. fine. Everybody's doing it. Everybody does this, this way and you're fine. You're not, you know, to them, I didn't see any seem any more abnormal than everybody else. But to me, I knew that it was a problem. I knew that it was spiritually, this is a problem really more so than anything else. I was, it was affecting me spiritually that I didn't have that relationship with God that I had when I was younger. Yeah. You know? It's like conviction girl of the Holy spirit, yeah. making you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. That hole yeah. that only God can fill. I was pouring yeah. everything else into it, mm -hmm. you know, men, guys, men, you know, uh, alcohol, just, just everything else thinking that, well, the world says this is what's going to make me happy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't making me happy. And I knew that that wasn't the answer, but the really scary part was when I would try and reel it in when I really kind of said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do this anymore. I couldn't not, I couldn't not, you know, come, you know, Thursday or Friday after I said, I am not going to drink this weekend. I'm not going to do it. You know, I'm going to mm -hmm. be good, whatever, do something else you know, by Thursday or Friday, I was like, Oh, you know, mm. it wasn't that bad last weekend. And mm. you were just overreacting like you always do. And, you know, you can, you can reel it in. Just don't go, you know, don't, don't try and go as far as you normally do, which of course that was an illusion because I knew darn well that, you know, as soon as I started drinking, I really couldn't control it. So mm -hmm. But I would, and again, that's part of the whole alcoholic disease that it's like, um, you know, talks about it's, it's not only an addiction of the body, but it's this obsession of the mind. So you just get obsessed on the drink and that feeling that it gives you that feeling of just oh, comfort and fitting in. And that feeling that it gave me was just so elusive. It was just so attractive to me that it didn't matter what the consequences were. You know, I could forget all that. I could just easily forget what had just happened two days, five days a week ago, a month ago, yeah. and just pretend be in complete denial about it. And be like, no, it's going to be different this time. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to control it this time. Mm -hmm. It'll be different. And I went through a, just a vicious cycle of that, of realizing that I, I can't control this. This has me and mm -hmm. I don't have any power of my own willpower now to stop. Right. Mm. And that was the really scary part. Yeah. But it also, also became like the greatest thing that could ever happen to me because in our weakness, right. Mm -hmm. it's strong for sure. It was completely humbling. I mean, it was terrifying, but it was also humbling where I got to the fact where I knew, okay, I, I need help for this. Yeah. 
Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, I can't do it by myself. Correct. And, um, and I got down on my knees. There was one night that just all these bad things started happening. Bad things were happening all along, but <laughs> bigger, badder things were happening. And, um, you know, it, there was just this sense of impending doom. Mm. Never got a DUI. I never got arrested. I never, got, you know, there weren't, again, somehow I was able to, to keep things managed in a way where those mm. things never happened. And again, I don't know why would I quit a lot sooner had one of those things happen, maybe probably, but it didn't happen. So um, but this was my own decision. You know, this was me making the decision. I didn't want one of those bad things to have to happen <laughs> before I made the right decision to right. do something about this. And I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So I had had a friend who had already, um, left the lifestyle. She was, um, she had gone to treatment and then now she was in AA, she was an Alcoholics Anonymous and so I ended up giving her a call and uh, saying, hey, it's me. You know, I think I need to stop drinking. And she's like, woohoo, yay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be one day, you know, or yeah. I was you would be anyway, because <laughs> I knew you needed it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just ended up meeting with her and she was already in the fold of this whole AA fellowship. Um, so she took me in and just introduced me to people and got me going uh, to the meetings. And, um, you know, I remember going to my first meeting and there was this woman up there, didn't look anything like me, her story, you know, things, she did things different, but I could relate to her, how she felt the feelings and I knew immediately I was in the right place. I was like, oh my gosh, like I had hope, you know, and God was written there up on the walls because it's like, you know, step one was admitting you're powerless, which mm -hmm. I had that step down. I was like, okay, I think I can <laughs> finally admit that I'm powerless. It took a while to get there. Yeah. I think I can finally admit that. And then step two is like coming to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity, just make that obsession go away of, you know, and being in that vicious cycle of doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results, mm -hmm. basically what the definition of insanity is. So, um, you know, and then step three is like, turn your will and your life over to the care of God. And then it says, as you understand him. So, you know, people can go in and I understood God as Jesus, you know, my God, Correct. Is yeah, God, you mm -hmm. know, because, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the podcast. I'm not a fan of recovery because I think a lot of them keep people in bondage. Yes. But to your point, if someone comes in with a knowledge of Christ, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really gray area, which we're not going to go down that rabbit hole today. But yes, I agree with you. But that's it's whatever God they choose, which can be the really downside because someone can choose Buddha or Mohammed or Krishna or turn to Kabbalah instead of turning to Christ who can literally take that, you know, bondage from you. But anyway, I digressed on that. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, and you know, I struggle with that a lot um, because I know that there are, I've talked to a pastor that I admire so much, you know, and he's like, Oh, they, you know, AA programs, a cult and this and that, and it's bad. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, it kind of saved my life because I got in there with, all these other people who, who I could relate with, you know, mm -hmm. they understood me. I understood them from yeah. that, that level of having that same, you know, disease, basically mm -hmm. disease of the spiritual dis-ease, the, the, the physical dis-ease that we mm -hmm. all experienced from alcohol and how it had basically ruined our lives. And then it basically says in the literature, like God is the answer. Mm -hmm. And all that, it really came from uh, a group called the Oxford group. So really mm -hmm. what's in that book comes straight from the Bible. Those 12 steps are really, it's exactly what it teaches you in the Bible. You know, mm -hmm. you're completely powerless. You know, you need to be able to admit that, get honest about the fact that you have no power whatsoever <laughs> and mm -hmm. you can't manage your own life, no matter what it is that you're struggling with, really mm -hmm. who you are, um, you know, come to believe that God can restore you to sin. So that's the faith part, right? And then yeah. turning your willing will in your life over to God. So making that, you know, doing that prayer where you're saying, okay, God, I'm turning away from this life. I'm giving you my life now mm -hmm. to do with it as you will, as you please, you know? 
um, take away this thing that I have so that I can do that. And then, yeah. you know, and then you work through the steps where then you write down all the wrongs you've done all your life. And then you go to confession with another person. It says, confess it to God yourself and another human being. So you're mm -hmm. really getting real about here's my life. Here's what it's been. Here's all the things that I've done. Um, you know, you take stock of the good and the bad. And then the next two steps, again, it's another prayer saying, again, you're turning your life to God. Okay, God, here, here I am on paper, you know, cause they make you write it out on um, here. It is in black and white. Like, here's me, the good, the bad, the ugly, mm -hmm. you know, I'm humbly, you know, asking you to remove the shortcomings in my life. So again, asking God to like, take all this stuff away. And then you have to go make restitution. Mm -hmm people that you've wronged. Right. So that's right. again, either offering forgiveness to somebody or asking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so again, but it's written in these ways where, you know, I've seen a lot of people walk into the rooms and they've had really bad experiences with religion. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you were to walk in there and it said like, Buddha or whatever, if it said a specific God up there, they would turn around and walk right back mm -hmm, out. Mm -hmm. Their view of that is whatever experience they've had. A lot of Catholics, just mm -hmm. a lot of Catholics in there. <laughs> um, you know, well, they're uh, kind of used to the confessional part. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> so they probably walked right into that. Like, mm, this is easy. No, I'm teasing. Yeah, just I kidding. Penance. I don't have to pay penance. We're, you know, right. So a lot of, you know, so they, you know, or they said, you know, my parents were Christians, but they, you know, my dad was a drunk all his life, or, mm. you know, so they yeah. have this idea set in and, you know, until you get to the point where you, you don't really have a choice anymore. It's like, go on to the bitter ends of your alcoholism or, you know, choose a spiritual solution is what AA mm -hmm. offers, but it also yeah. tells people keep seeking God, mm -hmm. like seeking God. It's not like create your own God. That's not what it says. And that's what I feel like people think it says a God of your understanding. Mm -hmm. You understand God. And most people are just, Oh, God is love. And you know, well, what does that mean? How do you mm -hmm. understand it? Does that mean you can just go and do whatever it is that you want to do? And mm -hmm. God love you or right. God it's just this ether energy that's out there, this karmic thing. I mean, I feel like if you really do this program the way that it tells you to do, like your seeking will lead you to Christ. Mm -hmm. Your seeking will le lead you to the God, you know, yeah. the one and only God. Mm -hmm. You have to continue that seeking. And if you seek with your mm -hmm. entire heart, soul, mind, with everything you've got, you know, God's going to lead you to him. Correct. Um, you know, but if you decide, well, I'm good enough at this place, I'm stopping here. I'm, you know, if you don't want to go further, well, and a lot of people don't, which is why there's a very low, you know, success rate. Correct. Uh, I was just going to ask that. With it sometimes. It's not because the program in itself, the way that it's designed doesn't work. Um, it's because people either stop, they don't want to do the, you know, they don't want to really look at themselves and what they've done mm -hmm. in their past. They want to go and ask forgiveness from people who they feel like, well, they did me wrong. So why should I go? You know, they hold on to that pride. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just a, it's a continual humbling, humbling, humbling of yourself until mm -hmm. you really know that like, I am nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Only God's grace Amen. got me here that saved me from this hopeless condition mm -hmm. and nothing of my own doing. Yeah. And now I'm here to now help the next person that walks into that door get That's to where right. I am now. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you something. Um, so, cause you only went through recovery. Was it one time? No, I went through because I, I remember during lunch. So, so you were in recovery, but then I thought that you had, um, relapsed and then it was kind of really bad. And then did you not, cause then you got breast cancer. Yeah. And then that still was not a wake up call for you. So how many times did you, okay. So that, I guess, cause we're bringing this full circle. So that's what I mean. So you were not at that point that you were when it finally hit home 
I am not capable of, I need Jesus to help me through this, but it took a bit. Right. Um, so catch us up to that point. So then you went to recovery, you kind of, it, it didn't stick. Right. And I, then I had a wonderful life. Everything was great. My relationship yeah. with the Lord was restored, mm -hmm. but I was about 20, I was 29 when I first got sober. So I was early thirties and, um, I, I just, even though life was great and my relationship with God was great, I still had this like fear. I had this idea I was missing out on something, you know, mm. I still had this fear of like, there's something out there that I'm not getting here and God's holding out on me. Or it, it actually at that time, I more had the idea and I didn't really do it right the first time. Cause first of all, I still always held this reservation that I wasn't an alcoholic, even mm -hmm. though there was mm -hmm. proof was to the yeah. contrary of that. I still kind of held on to this belief that one day I might be able to manage it and be okay. If I was a little bit more grown up or after a while of really being abstinent, um, the other thing was, is I was a little resentful towards people who could drink. Mm. I never, like, I, I would be very resentful at the fact that I couldn't drink without, you know, getting in trouble and all that sort of thing. So I felt like, well, I'm sober now, God, where's my parade? You know, mm. I'm yeah. finally what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm acting like, okay, God, I've done this for you. So why aren't you doing, where's my husband? Where's my, this, where's the, my dream job. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt there were conditions yeah. for me mm -hmm. on my sobriety. I realized after the fact, of course, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. like, well, if you're not going to do this for me, then you know what? I'm just going to go back out and drink again. Yeah. Maybe I'll get all those things out there in the world, yeah. you know? Yeah. And of course, you know how God is in the spirit. They're like, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to hold you back. I love you. Right. I don't do this. Yeah. It's not going to end well for you. But yeah, I know, right? <laughs> gonna, that's your decision to make. I've given you free will. So yeah. you, I love that because it's so much like the prodigal, right? Uh, the dad was like, okay, here you go. Take it and, you know, mm -hmm. do whatever. He didn't like hold him hostage in the house saying you cannot do that. So right. that's a valid point. So it's hundred percent. I always call myself the prodigal daughter because mm -hmm. I remember that so much. Of course. So once I did start drinking again, um, you know, there's another um, story in the Bible where it talks about, you know, when you've gone and you cleaned your house out and you've made it clean and all that. And then if you, invite those spirits back in again mm -hmm. they bring seven of their friends with them yeah. right mm -hmm. so you've already cleaned out that evil spirit but then if you decide to let it back in again it's like sevenfold and that's yeah. how much my alcoholism had progressed at that point mm. it, it was like it, it you know it hit hard it hit fast there was no transitioning from an drinking like a lady, you know, into, which is what I wanted to do, <laughs> to, you know, uh, just incomprehensible demoralization. Um, mm. Yeah, it was just straight kind of to that. But I had already resolved myself. It's like a, a switch just clicked. And I was just like, nope, I'm I'm going this way. That's the way I'm going to go. Tur I'm turning off any thoughts or, you know, of going back to where I was. It was, it was kind of scary how mm -hmm. easily that switch was flipped for me, but I was yeah. probably leading up to it for a while. I don't think mm -hmm. that's something that just happened overnight. Yeah. There were things leading up to that along the way. So, mm. so then it got worse, a lot worse, but I stayed yeah. out there and just kept doing my thing. And then uh, for another five years, Right. And then I got again to that same place again, this impending doom. Things are really going to start going wrong. And mm -hmm. um, I knew there was a place where I could go. But again, it wasn't as easy the second time. 
Right. It was much harder because again, it was much more powerful. It wasn't this whole new, you walk in the door and it's like, God, and <laughs> people who aren't drinking, who are just like me. And it's this new, fresh, like, you know, life and it's all new. And, and I'm on this pink cloud for a long time. <laughs> it's like, you already know what you're going back to and mm. the work that you're going to have to do and this. And so there was just, you know, I would come in and maybe get a month. But I would still be, you know, I, I wasn't drinking, but I was maybe smoking a little pot on the side. Mm -hmm. But God's like, that still kind of counts. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was that mm, that's still okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, you're in an AA meeting and you're not drinking, but yeah. you're really doing almost everything else. So that's mm -hmm. not how you let my spirit back in you. Like, I want all of you you know, not just part of you. Mm -hmm. I just, I, you know, did that for a while. And then finally I, I came back and I just, I surrendered again. I remember, mm -hmm. you know, again, getting on my knees and praying and saying, okay, okay, I'm ready. I really want to do this. I really, I'm ready to, to, to turn it all over to you again, this time for real. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did, but it was gradual. It still took a while for me to kind of get out of the lifestyle I was leading. Even though I didn't want to drink or do anything else anymore, I still was kind of in this, you know, lifestyle where, you know, of the rich and famous and a lot of you know, glitz and glam and athletes and sports and events. You know, there was just a lot of that where that, you know, the things of the world, those things were kind mm -hmm. of now they had a grasp of me too it wasn't yeah. just you know the substances it mm -hmm. was all the you know shiny things that mm -hmm. are out there that again also can take you away and I just knew okay well if you keep holding on to these things you're gonna you're gonna end up drinking again you can't you can't be there and do this and be in this environment and stay sober it's just mm -hmm. not it just doesn't work that way and so I just kept, kept making this, these decisions to stay with God and see what he had in store for me mm -hmm. rather than going back to what I knew what it was, right? Go home to the father yeah. and say, well, I'd rather be a slave in his house than live in the pig pen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. instead of going back to the pig pen where I knew what I was going to get there, I was like, I'd rather go be a slave in my father's house for the rest of my life. And that's mm -hmm. going to be a million times better than where I am now. So if yeah. that's, the, if that's the case, then that's, that's what I'm going to do. So, mm -hmm. so then when, at what point, um, so then clearly you re relapsed again and then it, so when did you get the breast cancer? Cause I know that you were drinking through that and yeah. that still wasn't a wake up call. So lead us into that progression and then we'll kind of bring it in for a landing about God's goodness to where we sit, me and you here today, just discussing this, life clip because sooner or later something clicked because you've been walking with the Lord now for a bit. So when, when did that transition finally say, okay, enough is truly enough. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, I mean, in the middle of my relapse, which was about five years, this was probably about a year and a half into it. I want to say, um, I discovered a lump in my chest and I was I immediately, I knew what it was and I don't know how I wasn't looking for it. I was just putting some lotion on actually and felt it. Mm -hmm. And it was, that was never there before. Mm -hmm. And it was there. And I knew in me, I was like, this isn't going to be good. <laughs> this is not going to be good. And sure enough, I went immediately, got tested, all that sort of stuff. And it came back um, that it was, you know, cancerous and surgery was going to be needed to be done. And um, uh, so I did, I got a lumpectomy. I did radiation. They wanted me to do chemo, but I said, no, I was, I just felt like that was going to be more destructive for me not only in the short term, but also in the long run. So there was still that little part of discernment in me that part of it, I didn't want to lose my hair either. I was like, I'm not mm -hmm. losing my hair, you know, part of it was vanity. So I'm just going to get real about that. That's okay. We're good. Um, yeah. That'd probably be the same way. The time. Mm, you know? I don't know if I want to lose my hair. <laughs> right. I'm like, I don't want to lose. I'd rather have cancer than lose my hair. I mean, that's what crazy mindset I was in at that time. But I actually do think that was the right decision for me. Um, yeah. 
in not only the short term, but the long term. But I took all the evidence, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and weighed together. And they were like, well, there's a 27% chance there could be another cancer cell. So yeah. a lot of it, I think, like you said, Earl, is money, you know, it's mm-hmm. a big, big business. The yeah. Whole- I'm not going to go there with chemo. I'm not on the, f- I, I'm not a fan of chemo. Yeah. So that's just my personal, I think there's a lot of holistic ways to also combat cancer. Yeah. God gave us the remedy of the earth. If we would just tap into that. Right. Yeah. But But that's another podcast. (laughs) Well, you know, everybody's different. It's it's, again, that is a personal decision that everybody needs to. I had another friend who was going through it the same right when I was uh, now I was mm. drinking the whole time during this. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember you telling I me that my drinking because mm. I was, you know, in my crazy mind, I was like, well, <laughs> I have cancer. So, you know, if you had cancer, my, you know, horrible luck in life, then you would drink too, mm. you know, I mean, more of a victim. Mm hmm. And, you know, alcoholics can drink a long time being playing the victim card, like because you drink at people, you drink at circumstances, Mm. you know, show you, you know, just hurting yourself, (laughs) um, which I think the drinking did cause the can it it had. I definitely think that that had a lot to do with me even getting the cancer in the first place, but um, just the perfect storm in my body. Yeah. Unfortunately, was that I- pun intended? Perfect storm. Does it strong? I- <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, you know, even knowing all that though, somewhere in the back of my head, I just, you know, I used it as more fuel for my victim fire that like, Oh, here it is again. All my friends are getting married and having kids. Cause I was about, you know, mid thirties at this point in time, I was about 34, 35. So everybody's having kids, getting married, doing this, doing that. And, um, and I have cancer, woohoo me, you know? Mm. Um, so I was mad at God again Mm. about that. It was his fault. (laughs) You know, I'm like, why'd you do this to me? Um, but, uh, you know, but in the, again, in the back of mind, I knew that, 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 you know, that I'd really been the one that caused it, um, And, uh, but again, I had another friend super healthy at that time, you know, runner, this great shape, she got breast cancer and then ended up passing away from it. So, Mm. and she did, she chose not to do chemo either. So I think everybody has to make again, their own decisions um, for some reason. I think it's funny because I heard another, um, we have speaker tapes and that go around in a, basically people giving their testimony is what you would call it. But, Mm -hmm. and then in the AA kind of way, their alcoholic history. And this one guy, he talked about getting cancer and he said, you know, I think I just kept my body so toxic that cancer couldn't survive in it. <laughs> you never know. Honestly. What, yeah. What happened to me too. Was yeah. I, right. Yeah. Some form of chemotherapy, you know, yeah. like, well, I didn't know this alcohol would actually cure my cancer. This is great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I'm not saying anybody go out there and try. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We're joking, joking. Disclaimer. disclaimer uh, <laughs> yeah. But, mm. um, you know, for whatever reason, God wanted me to stay alive. Uh, I think so that, you know, cause during that time too, I just, I was, I was terrified to die. Mm. Cause like, being like, I don't want to meet God. Like I knew, you know, I was still a Christian. I would say I was a Christian, even though you wouldn't know it by the way mm. I was acting, the fruits of my life. But you know, I still believed in Jesus. I still believed in God. And I was just terrified. Like, I don't want to meet God this way. Like, I don't want to meet him, you know, dying from a, you know, some kind of alcohol related incident or whatever it is. And then being in there and like going, Oh, Jesus, sorry. Like, I don't want it to be like that. I want it to be like, Jesus, you know, like, who did it? like you know well done Correct. well done that's the thought that kept going through my mind but again like i said i kept trying to go back but it was so like it had such a grip on me then that mm. you know it, it, but i still had that terrifying feeling um and uh so anyway i got over the breast cancer hump no pun intended there either but you know still stayed out there drinking for another couple of years so yeah. um until I really decided to 
you know, truly surrender this time, you know, that experience really helped me to get that step one, which is just, I conceded to my innermost self. Okay. You are an alcoholic. You have that, whatever that is, that soul sickness where you can't have a little bit of alcohol at Mm -hmm. all, or it's going to set you off. Like you, it'll, you know, I, when I don't think I had that the first time, or maybe I was still in denial of it the first time, this time I was not in denial of it at all. And this Mm -hmm. time I had a whole other like experience about it where I knew God was going to be saving me by his grace alone. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, me like, Oh, doing a favor for God. It was God Mm -hmm. doing a favor for me because he had saved me from it once before. And I just look back in his face, like, you know Mm -hmm. what? I think I might have something better, (laughs) you know, right. Yeah. has a better plan maybe than you do. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go check that one out. Mm-hmm. So there was just more of like this, this gratefulness this time. Yeah. The humility, um, more of just a, a true kind of surrender and excitement to the fact that once you know all that, once you've gotten to that true place of just complete surrender and knowing that this is a gift of mm-hmm. just grace then you get like excited to start then I really you know and I would still you know listen to preachers that I like like all along this time you know I I still never let go but this was when I really was ready to like dig in and start seeking God with all my heart soul and mind and just be like you know I want to know you reveal Mm -hmm. yourself to me show yourself to me I want to you know, I just want to know, I want more of you and I want to know you better. And it's just been this exciting journey since then of, then of God, you know, again, he does, he does bless me with things because I'm staying sober, but mm-hmm. I don't it now it's like, I deserve this. You know, I look right. at it. Oh, you're so awesome. Like, yeah. you, you know, yeah. I am yeah. on the right track. You're right. I'm going to keep going, you know, mm-hmm. and giving me those little God shots, sometimes we call them, or just mm-hmm. little reminders that like, I'm here with you, I'm blessing you, I'm, you know, protecting you. And um, it's just, it's, it's like this exciting journey where I just, you know, I seek after God now the same way that I did my alcohol and drugs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, amen. So the area in which you live in, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I've been there quite a few times, hence the reason I lost my patience with parking. Right. But right. um So if anyone is aware and you ever want to go to South Tampa, yes, there's parking garages, there's street parking, there's neighborhood parking. Um, It's just a nightmare. It's a cluster. It's, it's not well put together, but um, all the restaurants down there, shops, everything. It's a fun time. So with that being said, it is pretty um, inviting to the flesh on a lot of levels. So, um, and I know that you're, you know, you're busy when you're here and you have, you know, your group of people that you hang out with. So how do you stay, grounded. I know it is the Lord and I know people are like, well, it's Jesus, but what besides staying close to God, what else would you recommend, um, for someone to do to make sure that they're staying, you know, in the faith, because this is a challenge, you know, to have something that has controlled a great part of anyone's life and to say, finally, okay, Lord, I release this to you. You know, you're in control. You're the one who, um, I walk with, you know, and now we're decision-making through technically Christ and we're no longer t- decision-making through ourselves, but how do you, I mean, that's just a hard road to navigate. I just think naturally. So what would you say to somebody? Um, because people do keep going back and forth with that struggle. So what would your advice be to someone, um, today, as we kind of bring this in here for a landing for someone who is, struggling, what has kept you afloat? Because again, you do live in an area that is inviting on all levels. Um, You know, it is a pretty um, uppity area of Tampa. So, you know, how do you, you you were this way, one way um, a while ago, and that lifestyle was intoxicating. So how come it's not that intoxicating now? So speak upon that real quick. I'm a new creation. Mm. That's God has given me through this process process of sanctification. Mm-hmm. I've been justified through Christ. I became a new creation when I truly 
Well, I think it happened along, you know, it. I, I'm finally letting this, you know, new creation shine mm -hmm. and fully come out. And, and, you know, he, the things now that were so shiny and, uh, you know, enticing before, they just don't have that allure anymore. Mm -hmm. Actually, a lot of the things that I was really interested in, they almost just like make me want to throw up now, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know? shallow, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Or just mm -hmm. even depraved or just, you know, or, or greedy. It's just, God has created a, this, you know, done this change in me mm -hmm. and, you know, granted I've, I've been willing to change and to do things differently. And, and, um, you know, humble myself enough to allow him to do the work in me. Um, but it's still hard, you know, I mean, you know, like, especially yeah. being a Christian woman, mm -hmm. there course. are a few of us around, there are a few of us also in the program. And we, you know, we get together on the side a lot because, you know, you can't, you can say things in the meeting, but if anybody calls out their specific higher power, you know, it just mm -hmm. yeah, everybody gets, you know, some mm -hmm. people get comfortable, some people don't, you know, mm -hmm. um, I always have a cross around my neck. And <laughs> so when I'm speaking, I'm speaking as a representative of my higher power. Yeah. So you like the way I live my life, you know, mm -hmm. and are attracted to what I have. And you come to me and say, you know, I want you to sponsor me. I, I want you, which is what we do in the program is giving it back. Right. You know, first thing I ask, are you a Christian? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh, then we're, you know, like that's half the battle, baby. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, that's right. You have to start out with somebody. And I accept really anybody who asks me because I feel like God mm -hmm. puts people in my life. Yeah, and amen. Accept mm -hmm. it there or they don't like what I'm saying. Or, you know, they might go away from it. There's the seed is still planted. Mm -hmm. I've people come back to me recently this one girl who's struggling really bad a lot of mm. demonic kind of activity too and yeah. she was like I used to think you were just big as cuckoo and Jesus freak and I just thought that you were crazy she's like but I liked it <laughs> wow yeah kind of crazy mm. there was something about it that was attractive to me and I wanted that yeah. you know yeah and what you're saying, I didn't, mm. it's like, now I get it. And we actually did the sinner's prayer together a couple of weeks. Wow. I haven't heard from her really since then. Cause I was like, come to church with me now and you should get baptized and you know, all that. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, you go at your own pace. You know, we did, did what we needed to do. And sometimes, you know, it's quickly and sometimes slowly, but mm -hmm. for me, that's, that's what I'm there for is I think I'm more, um, productive in that way rather mm -hmm. than you know like we've said trying to shove it down people's throats and like right. ah you're all gonna go to hell in the tribula right. in the tribulation and mm -hmm. <laughs> get out of it like that's what I want to shout from the rooftops. Yeah, yeah. I just want to be like ah but I've just found that nobody really listens like <laughs> you know I still say those things sometimes yeah. to you know friends or family and things like that. So they know where I'm coming from for sure. But you know, I can't just like I've learned on my own that this has, this is a personal decision for all of us that mm -hmm. we all have to make, but I have to be able to share my experience and how my life has changed and why. And that's through, mm -hmm. that's through Jesus a hundred percent. Um, and you know, I've questioned a lot of times, like, well, I see people come in the program and they get sober and they stay sober a long time and their God isn't Jesus, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, they, stay sober. And, you know, I see their lives getting better and it becomes this conundrum for me, mm. you know, also know, that like, you know, God is gracious. God is mm. great. He, he, you know, these blessings that he gives to people, I think it's for them to understand where it's coming from. And that's where, you know, maybe they get to a point where they don't continue growing and continue just being able to open that door to walk in, you know, to say, well, let me, let me really check this out again. You know, I had a bad experience when I was a kid, or mm -hmm. I've always he heard that, you know, Christianity is a bunch of, you know, weirdos and, you know, you have to follow these rules or whatever it is that's 
kind of put that wall up for them to be able to really just open the door. And, um, you know, a lot of times it's just pain. It's like this one going through the pain or getting to a point where, you know, what you thought you had as being your higher power really wasn't what was doing it for you. Maybe Mm -hmm. it was like your own will, or maybe it was other things, you know, and not that. So I've kind of just, um, you know, I've gone through my journey. I know the truth and I want to give it to everybody else, but I know that that's just not, um, that's not going to be the case, right? This is the narrow road and unfortunately, and that just terrifies me for Mm -hmm. people that I sit in rooms with every day. And I just am like, ah, they just don't get it. And how can I, how can I, what can I do, Lord? What can I do? I mean, I'm constantly asking Mm -hmm. like, what more can I do? How, how can I be in a better example of this? Am I doing something wrong where they're not attracted to what I've got? Mm. I want Jesus too. You know what I mean? I just, that's probably also the darkened world that we live in though, sis. I mean, honestly, it's, and I think we're seeing that waxing worse and worse, you know, hearts are growing cold, colder, but you also, when you were speaking before, you also brought up someone that I really like him. And I, I, you know, I used to pray over him a lot and actually I probably need to start again, but Russell Brand, you just summed that up perfectly because he's had sobriety for many years, but he's not chose the road of a savior. Mm -hmm. He's chosen the road of many different gods um, and an avenue of, you know, Kundalini, which is very demonic an avenue of meditation. And so to your point, I agree with that. You know, you see someone like a Russell Brand and again, my heart breaks because he's searching, he's looking, but yet he's been sober, you know? And I just hope that, you know, I say that because I think he's kind of woke in a secular way. Mm -hmm. And I hope that when the rapture happens, maybe he'll wake on the right side. So we're going to bring this in for a landing here. And um, I want people to know exactly again, where they can find you. Your links will be posted in the show notes, what you have coming up, what, what do you see your future as, um, besides in a few months, once it gets really hot in Florida, your beautiful future in Colorado, which was stunning with the pictures that you have sent me. So on, or also on your social media. So let people know where they can find you, what's coming up for, um, Jessica and all that good stuff. I so appreciate you being here too, girl. It was a pleasure. Um, I know we got off to a rocky start, but, um, you know, um, it's just, all good. You know, me, my patience level is, you know, that of a, like I said, <laughs> smaller than a net. So, um, but I do, I, I appreciate you being here and, um, you know, where God is taking you, but you know, you can close it up here, let people know again, what's going on, where they can find you and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, gosh, I don't know where God is taking me. And a lot of times I wish you would just let me know. Yeah. That's the worst thing that I'm on the right program. Well, you've seen my new sign. Can you read that? I trust the next chapter because I know the author. Um, my yeah. sister and my niece got me that for Christmas. So that's my advice to you. You yeah. trust the next chapter. We don't know, but we know the author. And that's my thing is just building that trust with God. And and I do have a piece today in, uh, in mm. the midst of all this craziness and darkness yeah. and evil, because I keep up with all my prophecy people, um, you know, um, uh, Billy Crone. And, you know, um, I love that Rev 310. I, mm-hmm. I'm Pete. Pete uh, I love yeah. Pete. Found you was through yeah. Pete and Jan Markell. And I mean, I am constantly just on all those getting prophecy updates of this and that and seeing mm-hmm. how what's going on right now is through a biblical lens. That's how I view life today is through the biblical lens. And mm-hmm. it's like almost like a rose color glasses. Yeah. Because, you know, That's how we have to see it. I agree. Different. Like, you know, that, you know, God's still in charge mm-hmm. this is for a reason. And I mean, I know where my future lies as far as, you know, what's next for me in Amen. next life. I know where I'm rapture. Going. Here where we go. The rapture. I have no idea. <laughs> Hopefully with the rapture tonight. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe tonight. But, Amen. You know, God willing, but if he tarries, um, you know, I'm still working on this project and I'm hoping we've had a setback with actually my, the guy who's working on it with me, one of our producers passed away and the other one ended up getting cancer. So mm. we've had a setback with that, but I'm going to continue yeah. through with that. I'm, 
um, looking at, I'm involved in a lot of other charities and things, um, just whatever's really presented in front of me. I, I'm like, I look at it as, as an opportunity from God and I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. God, yeah. here it is. I know that if I open up and walk through this door, he might have something completely different that I wouldn't even know about on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. And I, that's the case is I just have to keep following the leading of the spirit and trust that, you know, and try and make do the right thing and then make the right decisions. And then, mm-hmm. you know, God's going to put me exactly where he wants me to be. I hope. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And give me the power to do the right thing in that situation. So, yeah. So besides Facebook and Instagram. Um, so I think those are just the two links, right? So it's an open account. Anyone can yeah. follow you there on those two platforms. Yeah. yeah. I think my Instagram's closed, but people can do requests. Mm-hmm. Or- so message me, even though it's close. And then I go and look at some of my messages. Yeah. You say that you saw me here, mm-hmm. you know, clips, then I'll know that you're not a freak. Like some of the other people that try and contact me that I'm no. like, oh, Hey, I'm not going to respond to that person. So Correct. yeah, that's the best way to do that. For sure. And that's why I wanted to tread lightly because I, mm-hmm. I know you have boundaries because of the family that you come from. And unfortunately there are a lot of weird, wacky people out there, Mm -hmm. you know? So, well, sister, you have been a pleasure. Um, I know that we are connecting again. So actually tomorrow, which this will air next Friday. So, but, um, or this Friday, I should say, but, um, you know, I, I was happy to finally get to meet you and thank you again for the mug and lunch and, um, getting my blood pressure up. No, I'm teasing, but, um, it wasn't that bad. I just, I, again, I don't have patience. So, um, next time we go to South Tampa though, seriously, the meat market, huh? I'm in your life to help you develop that spiritual. Patience. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know. Okay. Get out of my life. No, I'm teasing. I'm joking. But the next time we go to South Tampa though, seriously, I, uh, had the pleasure of going to the meat market. And guys, it's not like a singles pickup club. It's right. a restaurant. <laughs> Sorry, let's clarify that. And oh my gosh, that food was, I'm bringing like the, an old saying back, but off the chain. So oh, we yeah. definitely have to um, enjoy uh, the meat market because it was phenomenal. But, uh, and I went a little shop in there. So it was just a good time. I had a great afternoon. So with that being said, um, I know I, I'm, I hate to cut you short, but unfortunately I have got to get out of here. Hence the reason my hair is straight today and my makeup is done a little bit stronger because I got something to do. So, um, I got to look pretty where I'm going. You have a hot date? Um, no, I wish I did, <laughs> but no, <Yeah>. God has <laughs> kept me, you know, <laughs> It's been a while since I've been single. I'm not going to lie. And I don't, you know, God keeps me single, I think, because, you know, to your life clip, he knows my life clip. And it's not that I'm addicted to porn anymore or sexual activity by any means, but it's still something that I think that if God didn't put like this strong Paul type of figure in my life this overly godly man. Mm-hmm. And that could be why, you know, and I have to embrace the single life, even though it's a challenge. But then on the flip side, God has put some amazingly beautiful friends such as yourself in my life. And um, I think that kind of makes up the difference. Kind of, if you know what I mean, as a female. Um, yeah. I date so, Jesus. I always say, I'm dating Jesus. So. Yeah, and he, I mean, honestly, he's, he's a great he's a great partner to have in life, um, to be honest with you. But so anyway, girl, listen, with that being said, again, you've been a pleasure. Um, and then when things start working and you're in production or you're you know, um, series is ready to hit. Definitely have you back on for a little plug. Again, I don't have a, a huge reach, but I do have a reach and, um, I would love to share that with someone. So as I always say, until uh, we meet again, either here, there, or in the air, I'll see everyone later. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. To find out more information, go to lifeclipspodcast.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? Do you have questions, comments, or concerns? Send an email to questions at lifeclipspodcast.com. Until next time, family, I will see you here, there, or in the air. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus.